Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston from the International Space Station. I am ready for the event. Discovery Canada, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Discovery Canada's Daily Planet. How do you hear me? Daily Planet, Dan, I hear you loud and clear. How do you hear me? Wonderfully. It's great to talk to you. The energy level in the studio is through the roof right now. Why? Because Commander Chris Hadfield is here with us from the International Space Station. Chris, it is so wonderful to have you join us from the great beyond. Welcome. Thank you very much. I brought my own planet to Daily Planet today. It's nice to talk with you both. Commander Hadfield, all week we've been asking our viewers to submit their burning questions for you, so let's get right into it. Okay, first to get things started, we have Andre Dober, a grade 9 student from Vancouver, B.C. My question is, why do some astronauts experience motion sickness or headaches when they first reach the ISS? Thank you. Hey, Dan or Zai, can I get you just to repeat the question because it echoed through my speaker here. The question is, why do some people experience motion sickness and others do not? Ah, you know, we don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it's, and it's really difficult to predict. It's sort of like some people can ride in the back of a car and get motion sick, and, and some don't, or some people go on a ride at the, at the C&E or the P&E and they get sick and others don't. And even people in our vomit comet on Earth that get sick, some of them don't get sick in space and vice versa. So um, it's something to do with the interaction between the eyes and the balance system in the inner ear, but uh, we really don't have a good predictor, and so we just have to uh, anticipate that it might happen and be ready to deal with the consequences and get it in the bag just in case. So, Chris, have you ever experienced it personally? Have you ever been motion sick up there? Well, when I first get to space, uh, yes, I feel motion sick. When I was a fighter pilot first learning to fly uh, high-performance airplanes, it made me feel sick. But it's one of the things that your body's just trying to protect you. Your body sees a huge change in, in how, it, how it sees things and feels things and thinks maybe you've been poisoned because it doesn't understand why you've had all these changes. And so your body tries to protect you. It makes you want to throw up to get rid of whatever might have poisoned you, and it makes you want to lie down so you stop metabolizing whatever that was. So, so your body's doing its best. And almost everybody feels sick to some degree. Um, but after a day or two, your body says, well, I didn't let him eat anything, and he still feels that way, so that couldn't have been it. And then you feel okay again. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a normal human reaction. And uh, being in space, being weightless, is, is a pretty shocking change to your body. And, uh, and we get over it. We adapt to it. Uh, and after a while, we're, we just feel normal again. Next, we have two very young future astronauts of Canada. Hi, my name is Austin, and this is my brother Dylan. We live in Whitby, Ontario, Canada. Mr. Hatfield, is there any difference to build something in space than on Earth? And so, Zaya, Dan, if you could tell me again what the question was, because our speaker is about this big up here, and it doesn't handle young voices very well. The question was, is it any different to build something in space compared to on Earth? Ah, oh, it's really different, because uh, for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, where do I start? Let's see. If I, if I get out my tools. Let's say I want to build something and I get out my jackknife. So I've got my jackknife here to, to try and screw something together or cut something. Well, if I don't carefully put my jackknife somewhere, put it back in my Velcro pocket, when I turn around, my jackknife is going to be gone. So one of the problems is tools. How do you control your tools? Another is what you're building doesn't need to fight gravity. So, you know, if you look at Let's say you're, you're going to build the pyramids. 
you know, the pyramids are very tall, and so they have a great big strong base, and then they go up to a nice pointy top, because on Earth, with gravity, you have to have a big strong base on anything that's tall. Up here, you hardly need any base at all. You could just have a, uh, a pencil could hold up the pyramids. And so even your basic design of something is going to be completely different. So, uh, so everything from uh, how to keep your tools under control, how you're going to control your body. If I grabbed a drill to drill a hole in something, as soon as I touched the wall, my whole body would start spinning around because the wall's not going to turn. So how you brace yourself and then how you design something to build, you have to rethink everything when you're working in space and working without gravity. So fascinating. Okay, so Camille Arsenault from Barrie, Ontario has another question. And what she's wondering is at what distance a paper plane could fly if it is thrown from space? Well, let's see. We throw paper airplanes here inside the space station. Here's my, uh, this is a bag of tea. Let's say this tea was a paper airplane. If I throw it here in the space station, it just, there's nothing to stop it. It'll just keep on going until it bumps into the wall because it, it won't fall. And so, so you can gently throw things and they'll go the whole length of the space station. So imagine if you threw them outside the space station, there would be nothing to stop them. And they would just, they would become like the moon. They would just go forever. But since we're down so close to the Earth, there's tiny random particles of the atmosphere. We're not completely out of the atmosphere. There's, you know, it, it tails off to almost nothing, but almost nothing and nothing aren't the same thing. And so there are a few tiny particles of air, just enough to slow your paper airplane down ever so much so that over time it would start to decay. Its orbit would start to get dragged down into the atmosphere until eventually your paper airplane would get pulled down into the atmosphere. It would be going eight kilometers a second, because that's how fast we're going. And so if you can imagine an airplane, a paper one, going eight kilometers a second into the atmosphere, the, the rubbing with the atmosphere would burn it up right away. So it would fly for a long time until eventually it got pulled down to Earth and burned up like a meteorite. That would be epic. All right, wow. now from the St. Lawrence area, we have Nathan Purvis. What is the most important experiment on the ISS right now and why? Uh, Nate, there are the two ways to answer that question. From my point of view, the most exper important experiment on the space station right now is the one that I'm doing. And the reason why is because if I don't do my part right, the experiment probably will be a failure. And so right now, while I'm working here, all the other members of the crew are working on their experiments. Chris, is a, uh, Chris Cassidy is assembling one in the microgravity, microgravity science club box. And you really want to focus. And no matter what else is happening, that is the most important thing of all. But I think if you were just to come on board and think what is the most important one, I think maybe right now it's the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is collecting energy from the universe. It's collecting dark matter from the universe. And just this week, a person who won a Nobel Prize, uh, Dr. Sam Ting, who's in charge of that experiment, made a big announcement that they may have actually started to prove the existence of dark matter with that experiment that's on our space station. That's really interesting. It's not conclusive yet, because it hasn't been there long enough to prove it, but it we, th we think maybe we're starting to understand the basics of what the universe is made of. And we can prove that. We can figure that out because of the International Space Station. So that may prove to be the most important experiment on board. Okay, now Jesse DeHaan from St. Catharines, Ontario, has a very interesting plant question for you, Chris. My question to you, Commander Hatfield, is how does weightlessness affect plant growth? How so does Chris, weightlessness she's affect wondering plant how growth? does weightlessness um, affect yeah. plant growth? How does weightlessness affect plant growth? Right. How does weightlessness affect plant growth? Um, well, it's confusing for the plant, right? Because on Earth, plants grow up uh, pretty much. But what we found is, if so long as you can provide them with moisture and vitamins, whatever their roots are, um, and that can just be like in a 
in a moist cloth or hydroponics or in like a mesh uh, or a, a, a mix together like a sponge so that you, you can feed the plant then the plant will tend to grow towards your light source. So if you can set up a root system and then set up a light source, the plant sort of thinks it's the same as dirt and the sun, and the plant will grow. And we've grown a lot of different plants, uh, Canadian plants we've grown on board. We've grown trees, uh, small tree seedlings on board the station. And there's lots of other countries that have had uh, plant experiments. And we're trying to figure out why and how to grow them so that when we leave Earth, uh, we don't have to bring all of our food in cans and in bags, and we want to be able to grow and harvest food just like we do on Earth, a self-sustaining um, environment on board. And of course, also plants help purify the air. So we're learning how to do that. We haven't done it enough yet that we can count on it for our food or our air purification, but we have proven that we can successfully grow plants on board, and that so long as you control the roots and the light source, they can, uh, they can be healthy and make fruit. One more viewer question, all the way from Creston, BC, we have Jerry Wright. He's 60 years old. He's been following space exploration his whole life. He doesn't have Facebook or Twitter or even a cell phone to make a movie for us, but his question is, do you have to adjust the altitude and velocity of the ISS as its mass changes to maintain orbit? In other words, you know, things are coming and going from the ISS all the time. Do those changes in the mass of the ISS affect how fast it's going or how high up it is? That's a really cool question. Uh, and the answer is yes, but maybe not for the reason that you think. Um, you know, the space station's going around the world. We're going eight kilometers a second. You know, whatever that is, uh, almost 500 kilometers a minute. So we go from all the way from British Columbia, where the question came from, all the way across where you guys are in Toronto, right to Halifax in about 10 minutes. So we have a huge amount of inertia. We weigh, uh, uh, you know, half a million pounds. And so we're, we're, we're zipping. And, and so when you add one little spaceship, it doesn't really change how we have to accelerate or decelerate. It's as if um, a train rolling down the track doesn't really know if one more person got on or not. Now, if you wanted to stop the station, you'd have to worry about it. But what we really have to worry about is controlling the space station, because it's sort of balanced like this microphone. And if you put a great big mass on one end, then the gravity from the Earth will make it behave differently. One end will be pulled down by gravity more than the other. So you have to control which way the space station's pointed. And also, we have great big solar arrays that we collect energy with, and they almost act like sails. And when we had the question about a piece of paper and a paper airplane with a tiny bit of drag from the atmosphere, our solar arrays are huge. And so, in fact, our orbit constantly gets dragged down towards the Earth. And every month or two, we fire our engines for a few minutes just to push our orbit back up again. In fact, we did it yesterday. And we just pushed our, push ourselves up away from the Earth a, a few kilometers just, just to keep our orbit where it should be. Because if we didn't do anything, over a long time, our orbit would decay and we'd spiral down into the atmosphere. So, so yes, uh, ships coming and going do affect how we control and steer the spaceship. And yes, we do have to fire our engines occasionally in order to hold our altitude. Chris, can you pinpoint the moment you knew you wanted to be an astronaut? Yes, I decided to become an astronaut on July 20th, 1969. I was uh, nine years old and I decided to be an astronaut that night. And that's the night that Neil and Buzz walked on the moon. And I, I walked outside, I looked at the moon, and I thought, you know, up until yesterday, it was impossible to walk on the moon. And now, people have walked on the moon. So right now, it may be impossible for a little Canadian kid to be an astronaut, but heck, it was impossible to walk on the moon yesterday. So I'm gonna give it a try. And uh, amazingly enough, even though a nine-year-old kid chose my career for me, uh, that actually came true, and here I am now. And so it's just been continual progress getting closer and closer to your goal. The most recent step has been becoming commander. How has your daily routine changed now that you're the commander of the ISS? 
Uh, well, rather than just worrying primarily about my responsibilities, I now take care of what I'm doing, but also I, I think about what everybody else on the crew is doing. Uh, I look at everybody else's schedule the night before. I see where there might be conflicts or maybe a crew member is doing something for the first time. Um, I look at how it's all going to interplay with each other. And then during the day, I go around and, and check on everybody, make sure that they're staying on schedule, they're getting their, they're getting their greens, they're getting enough to eat, they're getting their exercise, they're not overworking themselves. And then I'm also responsible for the spaceship. So in the morning, I go around and turn everything on. I open up the shutters on the windows, uh, get everything working. And then at nighttime, I'm responsible for going around and, and putting the space station to bed, making sure everything's how it should be um, and that uh, the shutters are closed to protect the glass of the windows and all the lights are off that should be. And an hour ago, we had an alarm ring on the space station. One of our warning alarms came on. It said we had... Um, oxygen levels were low. So we worked it, and me as the commander had to sort it out, and it, it's just one of the sensors went bad. But it's more like instead of just being a team member, I'm a team member, and I'm also responsible for the whole team. How do you want to be remembered after this mission's complete? What is your mark on the space program? Uh, what I really want is to get things done, to get stuff done. I want our crew, the people that are living off of the Earth right now, to feel great sense of accomplishment in having really, when it was our turn to, to run this place and to do it, to have really done it right, to have, to have accomplished as many of the things as possible, and, and also to want to get off the spaceship recover and then run around and get back in line to get back on and go do this again. Because if people want to go do it again, that means it was a successful experience. And so as the commander, those are the two things that I, that I would really hope that, that I, can, uh, I can leave when I finish this job. Number one is to have really accomplished everything that we're supposed to do while we're up here. And two, that the people on board enjoyed it so much that they want to go do it again. Chris, you're making Canada very, very proud, and you're making Earth proud. Thanks for your hard work up there, and good luck to you. Well, Dan and Zai, it was very nice to talk with both of you. Thank you for paying attention to all the stuff we're doing. I think in the midst of everything else that's happening in the world, this is a pretty cool thing. As we're leaving Earth permanently, I'm really happy to be part of it, and I'm really glad to know you two folks and, uh, and help tell the story to everybody else. So it's great to talk with you, as always. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. And thank you, Discovery Canada. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communications.